Ladies and gentlemen, welcome for lecturing, welcome for attending, welcome for coming to today's Peace Palace Library Lecture. Today and Thursday, November 26, the Peace Palace Library commemorates the 70th anniversary of the Nuremberg trials against the principal perpetrators of the Hitler regime. The Nuremberg trials mark an important moment in the history of international law. Individual Nazi war criminals were held responsible and indicted for war crimes and crimes against humanity and brought to justice before a tribunal. The Nuremberg trials provided a legal framework on which thereafter prosecution of international crimes was built and thus led the foundation for international criminal law to emerge as a modern discipline. I would like to thank the Carnegie Library for organizing this event and for inviting me to the commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the start of the Nuremberg Trials. As we sit here today in a palace dedicated to peace and justice, it is difficult when faced with the heartbreaking events of last night in Paris to keep faith with the principles that are enshrined in this building. It is inspiring, therefore, to consider that 70 years ago, those who looked into the abyss created by World War II and the Holocaust could still put their faith in law. Ben Ferenz, the last living Nuremberg prosecutor, known to many of you in this room, maintains in the face of all of the terrorism, war, inhumanity, experienced in World War II and in the last 70 years, that there is no peace without justice, and there is no justice without law, and there is no law without courts. What was true 70 years ago in Nuremberg continues to be true today. But it is the first of these trials, the International Military Tribunal's trial of the major war criminals of the Third Reich with which we are primarily concerned today. Seventy years ago this coming Friday, the International Military Tribunal was given the task of trying 22 of the most important political and military leaders of the Third Reich for waging and conspiring to wage an aggressive war and for committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. It completed that task on October 1, 1946, issuing three acquittals and finding the remaining 19 defendants guilty of one or more of the four counts upon which they were indicted. Some might think it ironic to address gender crimes against women in the context of the Nuremberg trials. It is common knowledge that the charter of the tribunal does not expressly mention gender crimes. The indictment against the 22 defendants never charged them with gender crimes. They were, obviously, never convicted of gender crimes. In the index of the transcripts, the words women or rape are never listed. There are several suggestions as to why this was so. First, traditionally women were seen as spoils of war and not necessarily the victims of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Second, in the 1907 Geneva Convention, rape is not listed as a prohibited act, although it has been argued that it is covered in Article 46, which asserts that, quote, family honor and rights, the lives of persons and private property, as well as religious convictions and practices must be respected. Classifying rape as an affront to family honor is obviously a gross minimization and it implies that it is the family, or its patriarch, who is the victim. One can see how, in the context of the atrocities of the Holocaust, disrespect for family honor does not rank particularly high on the list of crimes to prosecute. A third theory is that investigators and prosecutors, all male, were uncomfortable in charging and investigating sexual crimes, particularly rape, 
and were plagued by issues of proof from domestic systems regarding defenses of consent and requirements of corroboration. Even if all this is true, I would nevertheless suggest that the procedural legacy of the Nuremberg Tribunal was critical to the evolving recognition of gender atrocity crimes in international law. The legacy is clear. When 50 years later, the ICTY and ICTR and my own court, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, were created, it was the telling of personal stories of gender-based violence that prompted gender-sensitive judges to recognize these crimes for what they were. As trial chambers heard more testimony from women who recounted the atrocities perpetrated against them, it became apparent that if the tribunals were to fulfill their mandates, they needed to preserve historically those accounts and reflect them in their findings. My first reaction was that uh, the Nuremberg trials get an unfair press when it's noted that they did not address gender crimes, because they did, but they did not address them as gender crimes. Uh, so it's gratifying to know that they recorded them, that they uh, considered them uh, to be part of the larger picture of atrocity crimes and crimes against humanity. What they did not grasp and what jurists and uh, those who are making international law now uh, have grasped is that there is uh, a gen that gender neutrality doesn't work that there are crimes that are committed uh, against women and men that are gender based and that are committed out of uh, uh, by people specifically on a gender basis. Uh, a popular term uh, in terms of gender crimes against women that has been coined, I think, by Eve Ensler is femicide. And although that has not made it into the uh, legal lexicon, uh, it's uh, an, an interesting framework in which to look at uh, the crimes and how to best uh, describe and address them. So uh, it, it was gratifying in a way to know that, that those crimes had not been overlooked in any way and the fact that such good records had been kept uh, of the transcripts and of uh, the, the testimony and the evidence that was collected in 1945 and 46 uh, forms a basis for us to look at and appreciate the fact that these crimes have always been with us, uh, but to appreciate further the fact that now, uh, thanks to the work of a lot of people who have gender sensitivity, both in the drafting of, of the statute of the ICC, uh, but also in the jurisprudence of the courts, that those are being accurately described, uh, named, uh, and given uh, recognition to the gravity and the harm that those cr crimes can cause. The ICC is the legacy of the Nuremberg Tribunal. The ICC is the future. The prosecutor has the legal tools provided by the Rome Statute and has expressed the intention of using those tools to fight against the impunity of those who commit gender crimes. Whether she and the ICC have the resources to carry out that intention, given the state of conflict in which the world finds itself, remains to be seen. But if, in fact, we still believe that there is no peace without justice and no justice without law, as the formation of the ICC by the state's parties would suggest, then I suggest that civilization now has even greater incentive, duty, and opportunity than it did 70 years ago to invest in law and justice in aspiring to peace. Thank you. As defense counsel, I spent many hours in the Peace Palace Library when it was located across in the, in the main building. It was an essential tool for a person coming from a domestic jurisdiction who was suddenly immersed in defending international criminal law cases. There was a lot of catching up to be done and there was a lot of learning to be done. 
I, I speak, although I build and am a judge of the International Criminal Court, let me make it plain that I'm speaking really from a personal perspective. This is not a policy perspective, it's not a, a statement of intent, it's what I believe and feel. It, it's difficult to overestimate the importance of Nuremberg. Of course there were the flaws, there were the allegations of victor's justice, a less than comprehensive appellate system, the death penalty, and a procedure which was uh, brand new. It literally had to make its way day by day, not least the rules of evidence and procedure, as Justice Fisher has pointed out. But what it did do is it showed the absolute determination to apply the rule of law uh, and to underscore the abhorrence uh, of mankind in respect of the dreadful crimes that were committed under the Nazi regime. In, in essence, it showed us the way forward in terms of crimes against peace and the crimes of aggression. I don't think it's too much to say that if it hadn't been for Nuremberg and to some extent inevitably Tokyo, we wouldn't have seen the ad hoc tribunals, we wouldn't have seen the ICC, and we wouldn't have seen the growth and development of international criminal and humanitarian law. And I suspect what that means in part uh, is that a great many people who are sitting here might not be sitting here now. Um, so we all owe a lot to the founding fathers and the fact of the Nuremberg trial and the way it emphasized, focused and concentrated on what was not a new topic, the crime of aggression or of unrestricted warfare, uh, but of the way that it was done in Europe between 1939 and 1945. Earlier this year, the judges of the ICC went on a retreat to Nuremberg where we discussed some ways forward and lessons learned. And we had that retreat in the Nuremberg courtroom itself, which was quite a powerful uh, emotional experience to be sitting there where everybody had sat 70 years before and to imagine the scene as it was. The courtroom isn't exactly the same uh, as it was back then. It's been modified to some extent, but it's still eminently recognisable. Um, for any of you who have not been to Nuremberg, uh, I, I thoroughly recommend that you do go there. You, there are plenty of opportunities to visit the court and to visit other uh, Nazi-era structures around and about the city of Nuremberg, and it's a powerful reminder of what went on. We are at some point along the road. We are not at the end, or even at the beginning of the end, of conflicts. Syria, um, on the international scale, we have outrages such as Paris, Paris last night on the national scale. Now, to date, two-thirds of the required 30 states have ratified the Kampala amendments. I suspect strongly that we will see uh, within the time limit, uh, the magic number of 30 having been achieved. Um, I recall the preamble to Article 5 of the Rome Statute. It is the duty of every state to exercise its criminal jurisdiction over those responsible for international crimes. It seems to me that that duty goes hand in hand with the principle of complementarity. In my view, uh, a state that ratifies the Kampala Amendments should incorporate Article 8 bis and the elements into its own domestic legislation as well and as closely as possible. At least it should take positive jurisdiction over its own nationals. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to present a little uh, an introduction, it's more or less an introduction, uh, into the uh, a film campaign of the US authorities in order to shape as well as uh, disseminate uh, the first international criminal court trial, the IMT, in Nuremberg. The 1930s and the 1940s provided severe changes for US foreign policy and demanded important decisions by the leading foreign politicians. 
An isolationist uh, position was no longer an option, at least not after uh, December 7th, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor, and the German declaration of war a few de days after. The U.S. would have to go to war. The U.S. would have, raised to, uh, would have to raise billions for that war, and the U.S. would also have to pay a great death toll for a conflict that was not considered their own. The U.S. Uh, would have to uh, rethink uh, strategies, partnerships. Actually, Japan and Germany were privileged uh, trade partners in the 1920s and 30s. Um, they would have to rethink coalitions as well as ideas for pacifying and stabilizing Asia and especially Europe, which was also uh, always uh, uh, an important point in U.S. foreign policy since 1918. Nuremberg, the International Military Tribunal, and that meant the beginning of a praxis of a working international criminal law, was supposed to be an important element in the attempt to stabilize Europe and to create reliability. By the banning of war as a mean of policy and by ensuring legal certainty for international relations. The punishment of the major European Axis war criminals by the IMT in Nuremberg confronted the US authorities not only with the consolidation of legal and diplomatic questions. Their intention also confronted them with the need for the acceptance of such dealing with mass crimes, not only in their own country, but worldwide, and especially in those countries concerned, first in Germany and then in Japan. For that purpose, a campaign was launched, differently using the medium film and addressing to different target groups. The German public was a target group that was paid a special attention to, and that was, within the framework of the occupation policy, an audience that could be reached via a maximum controlled uh, information policy. But also the world audience was important. It was important to tell them the US version of the Nazi crime history and to tell them how the US, a role model for constitutionality and democracy, would deal with these unprecedented crimes, I quote, so fair, so orderly, and so free from passion. In the following, I want to point out and explain the administrative background, show the variety of the use of film by US military agencies, focusing a little bit more on Germany, and the systematic as well as the master narrative inherent in these films. I want to close by suggesting some ideas about the contemporary actuality of these films. This includes a total of another 35 hours of uncut film footage shot in the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg that amount to the biggest complex of audiovisual material from the IMT. The footage shot by US Army camera teams was provided for government-run and private newsreel companies worldwide. And although the newsreel companies, of course, were free to process further the material as they intended, the US side had a kind of a monopoly on the moving images out of the courtroom. The United States of America, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union agreed that Germans would take part in wholesale shootings, executions, and their shared of the slaughter inflicted on innocent people would be judged by the people they have outweighed. The material that was produced in Nuremberg and that was produced for Nuremberg has a certain message. And this message is inherent in this film material. It's transported by this material and uh, it's uh, very much affected by the ideas that were developed uh, in the United States in connection uh, with their foreign and occupational policy after World War II. Um, this material, um, of course, was used by documentary filmers, by um, TV features and also uh, by fiction filmmakers who were uh, in somehow uh, dealing with this uh, trial and um, by using this film material in a certain um, period I'm focusing on the period from the 1990s on and especially in Germany after the uh, after the uh, unification of both uh, German states after 1990 um, this uh, film material impacted uh, on uh, certain tendencies in Germany, especially in Germany, uh, that were very much uh, directed to the uh, re-establishment of a, a criminal, international criminal law that was suspended for about 40 years. Um, Germany found itself, or the 
the official Germany found itself in the position that it was uh, that it considered themselves a victor, a victor over the two um, dictatorships, uh, the dictatorship of uh, Hitler and that of the communist uh, uh, rulers in the uh, former um, German Democratic Republic. From that moment on, some uh, legal historians say, um, also German um, lawyers who were very skeptic about uh, the jurisdiction in Nuremberg, Richter's justice, uh, contradicting to the Nullum uh, Lege uh, principle, which is very, very important in uh, German uh, legal dogmatics, um, changed their mind. They changed their mind because they wanted to deal also uh, juridically with the uh, overcoming of the German Democratic Republic. And in this situation, especially till 2002, when uh, the statute, the Rome Statute, was issued, uh, in this period, very important uh, juridical political discussions uh, went on in Germany that were directed um, to the foreign policy of Germany, for example, in connection with Yugoslavia. Uh, but also, and in that connection, also with um, uh, the revival of the international criminal law. And in, these, uh, in this phase, you can see German television, also cinema, but especially on the German television, you have a tremendous output of uh, um, pictures that were, or images that were produced by the Americans at that time. Um, and these images were designed by the Americans to tell the story of a success story of uh, international criminal law. That was the idea. And this success story was very gratefully um, took, very gratefully taken by the German uh, public in their uh, 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 public discussions about um, legal politics. And uh, so these images could impact on these legal uh, politic discussions in Germany very efficiently. Um, a very a very famous uh, example uh, might be Speer und Er, a film about Albert Speer, uh, uh, the former uh, uh, minister for, for uh, uh, warfare uh, and, uh, um, and the architect uh, uh, of Hitler, who um, became a very popular Nazi in Germany uh, because he was said to have changed his mind, have learned. He was uh, he actually received a 20 years uh, life, uh, 20 years uh, imprisonment, and after that he could um, he could uh, yeah uh, do quite a career in Federal Republic of Germany. And uh, in that connection, for example, for depicting this person. Uh, the, the trial came, was very important in the 1990s and, uh, the, and then in 2002 when this very big uh, picture by Heinrich Brilleur was uh, filmed. I want to continue with Nuremberg, its lessons for today, the film, I already said it, that will be screened on uh, November 26th here in this room. Um, this film is recalling the whole trial. A short prologue about the situation in Europe and Germany is followed by the longest part of the film, depicting the case of the prosecution, followed by a part focusing on the uh, case of the defense. The film ends with a summary of the judgment as an epilogue. Nuremberg, its lesson for today, was designed to serve an educational purpose. The two main parts of the film, case of the prosecution, case of the defense, do approach differently to the depiction of the trial. For re-narrating the four counts of the indictment, the acting of prosecutors and wit witnesses is very extensively completed by atrocity and Nazi newsreel footage, as well as film documents that intensify visually the verbally expressed or touched on deliberations. The audiovisual representation of the crimes in great, measures, uh, in great measure replaces the reasoning of the actors, especially the, prosecutor, the prosecutors and the witnesses for the prosecution before the court. Therefore, the film conveys an organic impression of the crimes that are envisioned dramatically.
this afternoon was very, very useful for me and I really enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed the mix of kind of the legal perspective and the historical perspective. I think it's very important for the Peace Palace Library, but also for all of us in The Hague to do something and say something in honor of what the Nuremberg Tribunals have done to change the, the world, but also to contribute to the development of international uh, justice. Because without it, I don't think we would have any of the courts, tribunals and initiatives for accountability that we have today. First of all, I'm an ICTY intern, so I have learned many things from this conference. As you know, whenever you uh, open a book about international criminal law or any article, it always, it always starts with I, uh, Nuremberg Court. So we have learned today many things. Yes, this uh, conference was definitely and indeed uh, very uh, educative. Uh, firstly, uh, because uh, at the moment I'm an intern at ICC and I'm also along that a PhD student at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. So my research as well as my work, everyday work, focuses on international criminal justice. Uh, it was very interesting to see uh, the um, and here the, the speaker's thoughts on international criminal law and Nimburg in particular, uh, especially in respect how the developments of uh, international criminal justice occurred through, throughout the time uh, in regards with uh, the uh, procedural insurance, uh, the standards of justice, uh, establishment of new institutions, also the personal experience of the judges on that topics, particular topics as well as uh, of the third speaker who is academical uh, and deals with uh, more precisely with um, filmmaking about Nimburg. It, it is important to commemorate these things. It is important to have uh, also diverse audience, especially among the um, citizens which are uh, or nationalists of the countries which are were co uh, conflicted uh, and participated and uh, in conflicts. So it's important to have a knowledge on that, of course. It's such an honor to be here in The Hague. This is my first full year in The Hague, and uh, I'm so, so pleased to be able to participate in events like this in the first place. Of course, it's extremely important to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Nuremberg Trials. You know, it, it establishes for the very first time individual criminal responsibility, as was mentioned today by our judges, and uh, it simply creates a, be a benchmark in international criminal law and to me personally it was extremely helpful because for example uh, Justice Fisher from Sierra Leone mentioned that one of the ways forward in international criminal law is starting to understand reparations and how we can bring victims to real justice through an understanding of making them whole again of repairing them from these incredible atrocities so that's something that's extremely important and I think that we really do need to think about reparations in international criminal law much more.